Computing Group Seminar Series. Welcome uh, to, to, to you all. Um, and we're very delighted that uh, Peter Love has agreed to give the inaugural uh, seminar in their series. It'll be the third Friday of each month. And uh, by way of advertising, we have the next two seminars lined up for the third Friday in November and the third Friday in December. Uh, the, we'll be sending out an announcement by the same means that we got this one out. And um, uh, Wei Zhi Du, D-U, in uh, China, who's working on time-dependent uh, scattering problems, uh, quantum scattering problems, will present the November seminar. And uh, Chao Yang from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, who works on uh, both high-performance computing and quantum computing, uh, will present his uh, uh, quantum Fourier transform work in at the December seminar. So look forward to uh, receiving our email announcements on, the, on those seminars. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Peter Love. Peter is a, uh, a longstanding contributor and leader in the field of quantum computing with a strong emphasis on uh, quantum many body problems and quantum chemistry. Um, he's uh, currently at uh, Tufts University and holds a dual appointment with uh, uh, Brookhaven National Lab uh, in their com computational science initiative. And um, I learned that prior to coming to Tufts five years ago or so, he was on the faculty at Haverford College. So uh, with that short, uh, uh, introduction, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Peter, who's sharing his screen. If you don't see the screen, try a different browser. Um, we have had problems with people not seeing screen sharing, but hopefully that's not the case. So please, uh, Peter, welcome to the, the seminar series. Thanks very much for that nice introduction. Uh, we're all adapting to this new reality of online talk. So do, if at any time you have a question, do feel free to just shout it out. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we've been talking uh, with James and uh, Xiaoyang and uh, various other people at Iowa State. So this is kind of part of an ongoing and, and uh, hopefully a continuing collaboration. So what I wanna tell you about today, um, well, I wanna sort of talk about some basic questions. So the first thing is just what are quantum computers and what can they do? Uh, the second thing is how do we use quantum sim quantum computers to simulate quantum chemistry, which is something I want to describe in some detail. Uh, I want to describe sort of the near-term prospects for experiment and what's going on there. And also then the sort of future work, uh, which uh, James is uh, involved in, is what are the prospects for quantum computing uh, to simulate high energy physics problems. Uh, the other thing I want to say is I, I have a cold at the moment. It's always nerve wracking when you see someone who has any kind of cold symptoms, but I just want to reassure everyone, I do, I do not have coronavirus, so I have a negative test this week. <laughs> so, um, so just excuse me if I'm a bit bunged up. Okay, so what can quantum computers do? Well, the real, uh, the real first injection of um, serious interest in this field occurred when Peter Shaw in 1994 showed that quantum computers could solve the factoring problem. They could given a very large number, uh, deliver its prime factors in a amount of quantum resources scaling only polynomially with the number of digits of the integer. So it's important to say that this is a problem which is not actually known to be hard, but it, the, the belief in the hardness of factoring is so widespread um, that factoring underpins uh, the RSA cryptography system, which is extremely widely used. So although we cannot prove factoring is hard and there's not unanimity on the difficulty of factoring, but the confidence that factoring is a hard problem is very widespread. So this generated a very large investment, uh, certainly from the intelligence community um, of money flowing into the field. Uh, kind of concomitantly with that, uh, the second thing is that one can search databases, or perhaps it's mildly more accurate to say that you can find a marked element in a list um, in a time which is the square root of the size of the uh, database. I'm gonna explain that in detail in a minute, so I'm just gonna move on and say the last one, uh, really, which is the first observation, this is an observation of Feynman in the 80s, 
is you could use a quantum computer to solve extremely difficult problems that arise in quantum mechanics itself. So the property of many body quantum systems in chemistry, nuclear physics, uh, things that really are at the, the leading edge of, of uh, the boundary of what we can do computationally with our classical machines. I always want to note, I, I sort of wish I'd never made this slide because every time I give a talk, I have to update it because the Simon Feynman citations get updated every year. Um, but it's worth noticing that this paper simulating physics with computers, which is the, the first entry on Feynman's Google Scholar profile, uh, which does not have a star on it, um, is now Feynman's most cited paper with the poor old space-time approach to non-relativistic quantum mechanics lagging behind. Um, so uh, that's just a fun thing. So, you know, this is this article is turning out, uh, you know, to, to be one of Feynman's most impactful contributions, I would say. So there's always, it's always good to make a few distinctions so we know what we're talking about. Uh, if we think about classical simulations of physical systems, um, there's an obvious distinction, which is analog versus digital. Uh, in an analog simulation, one has, one follows the mantra that if a system obeys the same equations, it encodes the same physics. So if I build an orrery, the motion of the uh, little metal balls in my orrery are following the same motions as the planet. So I can use such an object to predict eclipses and things of that nature. If I uh, am Wilbur and Orville Wright, I build a wind tunnel like the one in the middle picture. Um, you know, I scale the dimensions correctly. So the Reynolds number is the same as that in the actual aircraft I want to fly in. And then on the right hand side is a more modern version of that. A, this is a wind tunnel at MIT. Now the problem here is that if I want to simulate a solar system with 100 planets in, I have to build 100 pieces of brass uh, or I have to scale up my uh, wind tunnel appropriately. What I would much prefer to do is to do things digitally, which means I disc discretize all my simulation variables and now I, I can do much more. So here are some examples in the same areas. This is the millennium simulation of structure formation in the universe. Um, here are a couple of com computational fluid dynamic simulations. Um, and the advantage here is that if I want to say double the size of my simulation box, I only have to add one bit to all my simulation variables. Uh, so I no longer have this problem of the size of the simulator scaling extensively with the size of the system. The same distinction occurs in quantum simulation. Um, here's some, uh, a nice simulation, an optical lattice of YBCO, a high temperature superconducting material. Uh, and one can also do digital simulation where one takes a set of qubits. This is an experiment we collaborated with Jeremy O'Brien when he was at Bristol. Um, this is a digital simulation of HE, H plus, a small ionic system. Um, but here we're just using two quantum bits to simulate the relevant degrees of freedom in the, in the molecular ion. Perhaps a more relevant distinction that's emerged recently is in the quantum sense, if we think only about uh, digital simulation, i.e. only about encoding our problem in qubits directly, uh, is the distinction between quantum computers which have error correction. None of those really exist at the moment, uh, although there have been some very recent advances thanks to Ken Brown and um, his collaborators at uh, University of Maryland. Um, but most quantum computers that exist now do not have the ability to correct quantum errors that happened during the evolution. And John Preskill coined a nice phrase for this, it's the, which is noisy intermediate scale quantum. And I'm just illustrating it here um, on this new IBM roadmap that came out recently. Uh, and you can look at that in detail in the link in the bottom. And the, the goal here, I guess between 2019 and 2023, is to scale up the number of qubits that IBM have built without error correction first, but solving all these many extremely difficult engineering challenges at the bottom. And then they have a sort of clear and beyond uh, section, which is the path to sort of a million qubits. What they mean there is a million physical qubits, like a million devices on the chip. Those million physical devices would encode a smaller number of logical qubits, 
which are resistant to noise by virtue of measurements being made on groups of them that diagnose errors that are happening and then enable you to correct. Them. It's a remarkable fact about quantum technology that you can even do quantum error correction. That is, you can make errors, you, excuse me, you can make measurements that diagnose what error has happened without measuring the logical degrees of freedom you're using to encode your computation. So, that, so much of what I'm going to talk about today is sort of straddling this divide between MISC, things that you're trying to do uh, with noisy devices without error correction, versus things that one can conceive of doing um, with very large error corrected quantum devices. I'm interested in both questions. I think a big question right now is whether we can beat any classical technology for any useful problem using this NIST devices, and that's very much an open problem. So I like to say that NISC is nasty, brutish, and short, which is what Hobbes said about human life in general. Um, so one of the things that we've spent a lot of time on uh, recently is doing what's called VQE, which is a variational quantum eigensolver on NIST devices. And we've done experiments on chemical systems, very small example problems on the three leading implementations of quantum computing, which are photonics, this that's top left there, that's the plot I showed earlier that was done uh, in Jeremy O'Brien's lab in Bristol. Uh, Jeremy O'Brien has subsequently moved to a startup company um, where he's pursuing this photonic approach uh, very seriously. Um, the plot in the middle is a superconducting uh, experiment that we collaborated with Google on about four or five, five years ago. And the one on the right is uh, an iron trap experiment that was, again, we collaborated with the guys at Innsbruck on. And at the bottom, there's one of, uh, one of IBM's uh, results from their chip from a few years ago. There's a recent, um, and there's sort of the IBM chip and the recent result from Google, which both respectively made the covers of Nature and Science. Um, so the sort of chemistry approach here is now getting a lot of attention, I think, which is great to see. Okay, so now let's go back to the first question, which is what is a quantum computer and what does it do? Um, so I like to start with this postcard from 1922, which is the results of uh, the stern gerlach experiment. This is, these are the actual silver deposits uh, on a piece of cardboard that then they wrote on and sent it through the mail to Niels Bohr. Uh, and so you can think of this as a quantum bit in 1922. You've made a measurement on a physical system. Uh, that measurement has two outcomes, uh, which are the deflection to the left in the right-hand picture or the deflection to the right shown in the right-hand picture. And if one was uh, determined enough, one could use this kind of stern gerlach degree of freedom, which is just the spin of a, the single outermost electron of a silver atom. Uh, you could use that potentially as an implementation of quantum computing. Uh, we don't do that, it's just a nice illustration. Um, but any system, any physical system, which has two distinct measurable states that we can label zero and one is a potential qubit. Uh, we can represent that the state of that qubit by two amplitudes, which we write here in uh, bra ket notation. I know uh, mathematicians sometimes object to bra ket notation, but as a physicist, I've hardened my heart to your complaints. Um, so we're just going to use it today. Uh, the magnitude, these amplitudes 0 and 1, uh, 0 psi and 1 psi, are complex, of course. Um, and Born's rule tells us what the probability of observing a 0 and what the probability of observing a 1 is. It's just the magnitude squared. Of course, that's not terribly interesting until, unless something can happen to it. So of course, the qubit obeys the Schrodinger equation. There's a Hamiltonian that generates time evolution of this qubit uh, based on the physics of the system. So if it really was a stern gerlach type qubit, you would have a time varying, uh, excuse me, a spatially varying magnetic field. So as the qubit, as the silver atom traveled through that region, some uh, time dependent Hamiltonian would be applied to it. And uh, that would execute some transformation on the qubit. In quantum computing, uh, unlike in physics, we, we tend not to think about uh, Hamiltonians so much. We tend to think about the unitary actions that they generate. Uh, the reason for this is we wanna, we wanna dis define some particular unitary action on the qubit um, as a gate, a simple elementary gate. And then we wanna count how many of these simple elementary gates do we have to do to accomplish a particular task. 
And of course, there are, given a particular unitary operation you're performing on your qubit, there are many time dependent Hamiltonians you can use to realize that depending on the physics, the detailed physics of the qubit. So we like to have a, a layer of abstraction, if you like, where we can just think about zeros and ones without worrying about is this encoded in a hyperfine level or a polarization or a superconducting qubit state. And then when we go talk to our experimental colleagues, then we have to boil it all the way down to the physics of the actual devices. So let's look at some quantum gates and the way that we describe, uh, the way that we um, depict them. So the simplest one is a Hadamard gate. Uh, this is, can be represented by the little unitary matrix on the right. Um, all this does is take the state zero and one and generate the superposition state zero plus one and zero minus one. And if we wanna go beyond uh, one qubit, which we do, uh, we can have a two qubit gate. This acts on the pair of qubits. Here we have a controlled knot. This is actually a classical gate, but classical gates provided they're reversible and therefore unitary can, uh, can be used in quantum computing and are used widely. So what does this do? It looks at the, the value of the high qubit here, which is depicted by this upper line in the bottom left picture. And uh, if, that, if the value of that qubit is one, it applies a not gate to the lower qubit. Uh, if that value is zero, it does nothing. Um, and so this takes us to the quantum circuit model, which is what these little pictures have been showing. So a single qubit is, denoted by a line with actions going from left to right. So I act with a, a unitary gate, uh, and then I can just keep applying these unitary gates one after the other. I can have many uh, lines and many gates, so I can draw pictures of complicated circuits. And the action, for example, of this little gate, this little circuit made of the two gates I've already shown you, the Hadamard and the CNOT, if I take my input states on the left to be the state one and one. Um, I act with the Hadamard and then I act with the CNOT. The output state is this complicated superposition state, which should be familiar to uh, anyone in the audience from physics or chemistry as the singlet state. Uh, this is a complicated entangled state of the system. But overall, the way to think about this uh, excuse, me, excuse me, and we can also make our pictures slightly more easy to draw by just denoting a register with n qubits with a line like that. And overall, the um, overall the image you should have in your mind is this is a model of computing that's exactly like sheet music. So you have a bunch of lines going across that denote your qubits, and then you have symbolic representations of things you're doing to them that could be notes or chords involving more than one qubit. Um, as you go across. This, uh, what music is this? Well, okay, so originally in the first version of this talk that I made, this was uh, God Save the Queen, um, but then Brexit happened and I got very annoyed with the British government, so this music that's displayed here is uh, Ode, Ode to Joy, which is the national anthem of the European Union. Okay, so let's do something. Let's talk about Grover search, which is a nice algorithm to discuss. So our setting is we have uh, n qubits, which means we have two to the n possible uh, logical states of the qubits, two to the n assignments of zero and one to all our, all our qubits. Um, that forms a basis, uh, the logical basis for our Hilbert space. And our goal is we have one marked item y that we want to find among all these two to the n states. So a needle in an exponentially big haystack. I'm gonna define some useful states. So uh, one useful state is this plus state on the left, which is the uniform superposition of all possible states. So that's the uniform superposition of all possible answers. And then the one on the right, W, is the uniform superposition of all the states except the right answer. So I like to say that these are familiar things from teaching. You know, you have uniform superposition of all possible answers and then the uniform superposition of all possible wrong answers. Now, one important thing about Grover search is it's what's known as unstructured search, which basically means that if I make a guess 
I say, is, is the marked item some value X? And the answer is no. I am absolutely no closer to finding Y than I was before. So that I'm, there's no sense in which I can build up some partial picture from a sequence of queries that are incorrect. So what that means is that the unstructured search, the algorithm happens in a subspace that's two dimensional. There's no point distinguishing between different one ans what different uh, wrong answers. Therefore, I might as well just operate in this two dimensional space where every wrong answer is uh, equivalent uh, to each other and the right answer. So because that's two dimensional, it makes it a nice pedagogical answer because uh, a pedagogical example because I can draw a picture. So here's the picture that I was giving you before. So the uh, Right answer Y is at the North Pole here. Uh, and the uniform superposition of all wrong answers, which has no component of Y and therefore is perpendicular to Y, is the X axis. Uh, and plus that state, which is the uniform superposition of all answers, is of course rotated ever so slightly towards Y. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do we do? So there's our three uh, important states. Of course, we, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, what we're going to do now is introduce a dynamics, which is based on two operators. So uh, the first operator is a reflection uh, through the plane perpendicular to y. And the second is a reflection through the plane perpendicular to the uniform superposition of all states. And it is a geometric fact that if you have the product of two reflections, you get a rotation. And so let me, let me just perform these two operations. I reflect through the plane of all the wrong answers. And I go down here. So this looks bad. I've gone away from where I want to go. But then I reflect through plus. And at, hey presto, I've rotated by an angle theta towards the correct answer. And so each application BA rotates by theta towards the marked state. So how many of these operations do I have to do? Well, if I have n elements, so big N here is two to the little n, it's the number of elements in my database. So theta, is just the angle uh, of, it's just the angle theta defined in this picture, which it turns out is twice the arc sine of one over root n, which for very large n, which is the only case we're really interested in, um, is two over the square root of n. And um, that gives me the angle. So of course, for large n, we have to rotate basically through a right angle. And that gives me the number of iterations is pi over two divided by theta, which is just pi over, pi over four times the square root of n. And so that tells me that with a number of this, this, these operations that grows like the square root of n, I can uh, obtain the correct answer to this search with high probability. Of course, it also tells me if I keep going, I'll just go round and round and round in the circle and things will start getting worse again, which is an interesting feature of using unitary uh, reversible op operations. <coughs> so this takes uh, order n operations uh, classically to find one marked entry in a list where you only can receive an answer yes or no, this is the correct entry. Uh, so this is a, what's called a polynomial speed up. It's a speed up from n to root n. And this is an algorithmic technique that you can use more broadly in settings that are not simply uh, unstructured search. And the algorithmic technique is called amplitude amplification. Okay, so let's talk about another uh, application of quantum computing, which is determining, uh, determining energy eigenvalues. So one thing I can do is prepare an energy eigenstate, which is an eigenstate of U. What does that mean? It just means if I apply U, I multiply the state by a phase, e to the minus i omega t, where omega is, is related to the energy by Planck's constant. So what can I do? I can generate, here's our Hadamard friend again, I can generate a uniform superposition state on some ancilla qubit at the top. 
I can then do a controlled evolution under you. So if the ancilla state is in state zero, nothing happens to my uh, state psi. If the ancilla state is in state one, uh, I apply my uh, unitary evolution. Ah, but psi is an eigenstate. So all that does is apply a phase to psi. So the state produced uh, actually can be separated into a state on the ancilla, which has encoded into it this phase omega. Okay, but psi is left unchanged by virtue of the fact it's an eigenstate of u. All right, so now this trick here is called phase kickback because the phase is kicked back into the ancilla uh, qubit. Okay, so now I can take just my ancilla state, I can do a Hadamard gate on it again. And what that does is it moves the uh, relative phase down so that the amplitudes of seeing zero and one now depend sinusoidally on uh, the, the phase omega t over two in this case. And so if I do repeated measurements, this is a very crude way of doing the experiment. Um, if I do repeated measurements for varying amounts of time, I can generate a plot like that on the right, i.e. an oscillation whose frequency is exactly the eigenvalue of uh, the state psi. And so I can determine by careful measurement the, the value of the state uh, psi just by doing a classical Fourier transform on the data. This is what I've described here is just a formalization of what's called Fourier transform spectroscopy um, in the circuit model. You may say, okay, well, why do I have to do all these repeated measurements and classical Fourier transforms? Can't I do all that quantumly? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, that algorithm is called phase estimation. So in order to do that, I have to uh, apply powers of my uh, unitary evolution, and then I have to do a quantum Fourier transform. Okay. So this phase estimation algorithm is really a workhorse of all quantum algorithms. Shaw's algorithm factoring, for example, is based on phase estimation. And uh, here we're just, we, all we're doing here is just doing the Fourier transform on the quantum computer. And an important point to know about phase estimation is the cost scales like the relative energy excuse me, the relative error in the energy. So it's, you know, it scales like delta E over E. Um, that's not as good as it could be. You might dream of an algorithm that would scale like the number of digits of precision in the energy. We don't have such algorithms. And in fact, there are good profound reasons to believe that those algorithms don't exist. All right. So what I just told you is that to measure energy eigenstates, we have to simulate time evolution. Um, using a quantum computer. And that means we need to write a circuit for you. Uh, I can already see that I'm way, kind of, way out of whack with my time. So uh, I'm gonna try to be a bit more economic. So U is defined in terms of some Hamiltonian. Uh, and now the question is, how do we write a quantum circuit for a time evolution under a Hamiltonian? So the, the what I'm going to describe now is a couple of ways in which you can efficiently present a Hamiltonian and then perform this task. Uh, so the simplest case is when the Hamiltonian is a sum of some small number of terms. Uh, we can discretize T and then take time slices and then uh, write a circuit for evolution under each term separately. Uh, that's called trotterization. It's a very old uh, technique, a very old idea. Um, or you can take this some representation of your Hamiltonian, I represent it as a sum of terms, and use what, I call, what I'm just going to call post-trotter methods, which emerged really in 2015, in the last five years. Uh, so this gives us the general problem of quantum simulation, which is given a Hamiltonian, uh, which is a sum of some number of terms. The number of terms can't be exponentially large. Um, we want to apply uh, time evolution under this Hamiltonian which is time evolution under the sum, the exponential of the sum. Uh, and our ingredients are, we assume we can apply evolution separately under each term. And of course, the thing that cooks us, the thing that makes this a challenging problem is uh, in general, e to the a plus b is not equal to e to the a times e to the b if a and b are operators. That depends on the commutation of a and b. And one can have a lot of fun doing calculations with the Baker Campbell Hausdorff uh, formula uh, to calculate all the errors in various approaches here. But let me tell you what, what can 
these terms HKB, what kinds of presentations of Hamiltonians do we know how to deal with? The first answer is that HK could be a local Hamiltonian, meaning it could couple pairs or triples or quadruples of the qubits at any one time. So the terms could be tensor products, for example, of Pauli operators acting on each qubit. So many, many, many spin models in uh, condensed matter physics are of this form, the Heisenberg model, um, various other things. Many more artificial models have been written down, um, for example, in quantum error correction. Um, but this is a, clearly an efficient presentation. I can couple all, all pairs of my uh, qubits. There's only order n squared of those or all triples or whatever I want. So how do I simulate Hamiltonian evolution for a local term? So let's just take one term and I'll tell you how to do it. So let's take x, z, y, x. And so how do I simulate evolution under this single term? Well, the first thing I do is I rotate each of my qubits so that every uh, so that this term is transformed into a term which is all z z z z. Okay, so I can rotate x to z, y to z, x to z. Uh, that's what these operations wrapped around this central block are doing. They're rotating the local basis uh, and then unrotating it so that the answer that comes out at the end is correct. Okay, so now I've, all I've done is reduce the problem. All I now need to do is know how to simulate under tensor products of z's. So z, 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 z. And that's easy. Okay, so what does this product of poorly z's do? Well, here I've got four qubits. I've got a z operator on each qubit. So that multiplies the wave function by minus one if that qubit is in state one. It doesn't do anything if the qubit's in state zero. So what ends up happening to every basis state is it gets multiplied by minus one to the parity of the logical basis state. So all I really need to do is compute the parity, rotate by this angle CK, and then uncompute the parity. And so this, uh, this ZZZZ operation can be uh, simulated by this circuit. And what I've got here is a, a C naught. What that does is add mod two, uh, the entry, the, the value of the top qubit to the value of the second qubit to the next most qubit, and then it adds that value to the next one, adds that value to the next one. So written into the bottom line qubit here is the parity, i.e. the sum mod two, of all of the values of the qubits. And then I can rotate, I can just do an RZ rotation, which is just a single qubit gate, and then I uncompute that parity, which puts everything back again. This is an exercise in Nielsen and Chang, which is worth doing. Um, but it shows that with a small number of uh, CNOTs and uh, rotation gates, um, you can simulate these kinds of terms, these kinds of local terms. So it's a very nice illustration of, of how this uh, quantum circuit model can help us think about this. Let me tell you though, if you show an experimentalist these C naught ladders, they don't like it. So for a long time, these doing these ladders of C naught, one C naught after another after another, was an obstacle to doing any kind of experiments in this area. And then experiment moved forward through lots of uh, hard work by a lot of brilliant people. And now we can now we can do these kinds of calculations. Okay. So now we've, we know how to do some kind of simulation, simulation of local Hamiltonians. Let's think about something we want to do, which is simulating fermions on our quantum computer. Uh, this electrons are fermions. So that means that this is the key to doing simulations of molecular electronic structure, for example, or things in condensed matter like the Fermi Hubbard model. Um, so this was the topic of this paper that uh, Alain Asperu Guzik, Anthony de Troyes, and, and Martin Headcorn wrote back. 15 years ago now, although it seems like yesterday, um, which really was applying these kinds of simulation techniques to the computation of uh, molecular electronic structure, i.e. the electronic energy of molecules. And this plot was a big deal for us uh, when we uh, first made it uh, back in 2005, because it was the first time we'd written down problems that were really hard classically, that only used a thousand or so qubits. Uh, at that time, the leading algorithm, as I said, was kind of Shaw's algorithm, which needed way, way, way more qubits. 
So the idea that there would be small examples that would be interesting but hard for classical computation was a big part of our thinking. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, in that paper, this is a picture uh, I found on the internet a while ago. Someone's connected a USB stick to a parallel port in a, in a computer, which is a major achievement. Um, if you Google for images like this nowadays, what you get is the same kind of picture with all different kinds of Apple adapters ever since Apple decided that they would make all their profits out of selling as adapters. Um, but what we did in that paper in 2005 was take a bunch of techniques that were well established that we knew would work and kind of glue them together to make an algorithm for doing calculations in quantum chemistry. And that's because our concern was that um, we wanted to make it transparent that this was going to work and was going to scale polynomially. Uh, when you do scaling, uh, make scaling arguments, though, it's very rare that those would give you actually optimal algorithms. So a lot of time and energy uh, by myself and many other people has gone in the last 15 years into making these kinds of algorithms more uh, practical. So here's the sort of set of adapters that we plugged together in the original paper. We used the the second column size representation uh, combined with the Jordan Wigner. We used adiabatic preparation, trotterization. And so gradually over the years, we've replaced all these things with um, various other new ideas, um, hopefully with the aim of optimizing these uh, methods. And there are now, uh, thanks to the efforts mainly of the Google group, there are now estimates of serious calculations um, one could do where on a large scale error corrected quantum device of, of difficult uh, molecular simulations. So how does it all work? So we um, take the start with the molecular electronic Hamiltonian, which is just the Coulomb interaction uh, plus the electronic uh, kinetic energy, uh, plus the interaction of the electrons with the nuclei. The nuclear nuclear interactions are regarded as classical. So the goal is to calculate the energy as a function of the positions of the nuclei. That's a physicist's picture of chemistry. Uh, out of that, you can get reaction rates, you can get uh, bond angles, equilibrium structures. Many of quantities in that problem actually can be calculated accurately and efficiently by classical approximate methods, but there remain many problems that are difficult. Of course, this is a problem defined in terms of continuous variables. So now we want qubits, so we have to discretize. That's fine. The chemists have already done that for us. Uh, so we discretize in a basis of molecular orbitals, which are solutions of some um, one particle eigenvalue problem, usually a Hartree-Fock problem, which just means a kind of mean field solution. And then we want to think in terms of operators, not wave functions. So we define all. Uh, we define creation and annihilation operators, um, which obey the following commutation relations, which is just a way of encoding the fact that electrons are fermions and therefore have anti-symmetric wave functions under particle exchange. At the end of all that labor, we have the second quantized Hamiltonian. We have not done any work to create this. This is something you can extract from programs such as games um, or many other quantum chemistry packages at this point, and these uh, coefficients hij and hijkl are things that with with some labor you can extract out of these packages and hey presto you've got a nicely defined interacting fermion Hamilton. From there what's the representation? Well we use the uh, occupation number basis uh, so that means that we naturally have a basis which is binary. Uh, each of these orbitals can be occupied or unoccupied that gives a zero or one. And so we have a vector of occupation numbers that we can play with. Now, we can go back to 1928, the same year, same year that the Schrodinger equation was written down, and um, we can use the jordan Wigner transformation, which maps spins to fermions, and instead use it to map fermions to qubits. And so the orbital occupancy vector, which I've written here, goes over in the jordan Wigner transformation in just in this very simple one-to-one -one fashion. So everything is just mapped straight across. The tricky part is what happens to the operators. So the operators, the creation and relation operators know about fermion anti-symmetry. So they carry with them this phase, which depends again on the parity of the occupancy. 
And so when you write down qubit fermion uh, creation and annihilation operators, they grow tails. So you have an uh, operator which naturally takes a zero and makes it a one. That's a qubit creation operator or takes a, a one and makes it a zero. That's a qubit annihilation operator. But to that operator, you have to attach a tail of Zs, which goes over all the qubits that have an index less than the qubit you're acting on. And the magic of those Zs is when you calculate the commutation relations, uh, the, they come out correctly. They give you the correct fermion uh, creation relation operators. And that's just the, the magic of the jordan Wigner transformation. This problem is, though, that the operators in your Hamiltonian then become n local in general. Um, so you have this very high locality Hamiltonian. As I just told you, you can simulate those operators. It just means a lot of CNOTs, a lot of really long ladders of these CNOTs. So something uh, interesting that was done by Sergei Bravi and Alexey Kitayev, uh, Bravi is at IBM and has been a leading light uh, there for a long time. And Alexey Kitayev is a professor at Caltech with many uh, amazing contributions to theoretical condensed matter physics and beyond. Um, so they wrote a paper back in 2002, uh, which we uh, finally understood in 2012. Um, and they created an alternate uh, representation of fermions on qubits. So the way to think about this is that, in the, is that you have two types of information you need to pay attention to. You need to pay attention to occupancy, but you also need to pay attention to parity, which basically means the number of ones in between any pair of qubits. Obviously, in the Jordan Wigner representation, occupancy is encoded completely locally. You can tell it just by measuring one qubit. But that means parity is totally non local, giving rise to these uh, horribly non local operators. So, what uh, Bravi and Kateyev did was to determine a representation where you store in your qubits sums modulo two of subsets of the qubit. So neither parity nor occupancy is stored locally. To determine either, you have to look at groups of qubits. But those groups of qubits only grow with the logarithm of the total, total number of qubits, which means they grow very slowly. And so that's a, hugely, a huge improvement. You now you have a Hamiltonian, which is logarithmically local um, instead of being n local. Um, and so how, what, what does that transformation look like? Well, these partial sums, every other qubit occupancy just goes straight over. But then I take all of the qubit occupancies and I compute the total parity and put it in the bottom. Then I take the first half, I took, take the parity and put it in the middle. I take the first quarter and so on and so forth. This, this, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, this, uh, this um, construction just reminds you of the time when you had long plane flights to make slides like this with a lot of animation. Okay, so what's the implication? Uh, the implication is that instead of having long C knots that involve order n gates, you have order log n gates. All right, so uh, I see I have a couple of minutes before we have 45 minutes. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Let me just take this because it's my daughter's school. Hello. Yeah. So, um, the second answer is that the, the second answer to what can the terms in the Hamiltonian be uh, is that they could be sparse. Uh, this is, of course, something very familiar. So in the same picture where we, we have this occupation number basis, uh, there's an obvious inefficiency, which is we're storing in the states of the qubits every possible number of electrons. And chemistry problems are, of course, usually defined by having a definite number of electrons. And so, what we can do is be more efficient by storing only the indices of the occupied orbitals. So above we have, we assign a piece of data to every possible orbital. Uh, in the second row, we just keep track of the three occupied orbitals. Um, 
The problem in this representation is how do you simulate time evolution? And the answer to that is that if you write down the Hamiltonian basis, it's sparse. That's called the CI matrix in chemistry. And this gives us another definition of easy. I'm just going to skip over this slide because I can give you the presses pretty quickly. Um, it is a fact that we can simulate diagonal Hamiltonians efficiently provided you can calculate the diagonal elements efficiently. This is the kind of detail you have to worry about. Obviously, if it's very, very, very hard to calculate the value of the elements, you know, everything is hopeless. But if there's some reasonable function of the indices, then, um, then you can simulate under a diagonal Hamiltonian. Um, a sparse Hamiltonian or a one sparse Hamiltonian is just a diagonal Hamiltonian where you've scrambled up the positions of the entries. And as long as you can compute the positions of the non-zero entries as well as their values efficiently, then it turns out we can simulate those efficiently on a quantum computer. Okay, so all of that was simulating time evolution with the goal is to uh, be able to do phase estimation, to be able to implement very large complicated circuits on an error corrective machine. What if we want to do something today? So the, um, as part of this work, uh, the variational quantum eigen solver was developed during uh, Jared McLean and Ryan Babush's PhD uh, thesis, both of whom are at Google now. Um, so the goal is, of course, we want to find the smallest eigenvalue of a Hamiltonian, which now we have successfully written through all the constructions I've described as a linear combination of Pauli matrices. So a, a very simple way of doing this is to variationally minimize uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Forget all this state preparation and phase estimation stuff. Just, just create some state and make use with some parameters in it, variationally minimize over the parameters and away you go. And all you have to do then is a bunch of separate experiments in which you estimate the expectation of these Pauli terms PI, which it turns out is rather easy to do. The problem is there's a large number of measurements, but we're working on that. Um, so, so this is something that you can do with a very small quantum computer. And as a result, um, is something you can do on computer, quantum computers today, uh, which is, uh, generated, I think, a lot of activity on this method. So here's a good, uh, a, a nice plot uh, illustrating this. So here, uh, this is from a, the 2015 paper with Google, where we were able to do both a phase estimation experiment, which is the blue X's, and a VQE experiment on hydrogen molecule in this, in this minimal possible basis. Um, what this shows is that the phase estimation experiment, which is the more quantum experiment, it uses more technique, um, uses, uh, is, is worse. And the reason for that is the circuits are bigger. They're longer, they involve more gates. Therefore, they're more susceptible to noise. The VQE, VQE experiment, which, is used, which uses instead many short circuits, is less susceptible to noise and therefore can better reproduce uh, the, disasso the dissociation curve. And so that's kind of a, a good uh, way of thinking, I think, about the NISC era is we can't use the quantum algorithms we would really like to use because they need too many gates. We don't have the resources. So we cook up these uh, NISC type algorithms that will work on the devices, even though what, once we start scaling them up, perhaps uh, they have some negative uh, problems like requiring too many measurements and so on and so forth. So, um, hang on. What I want to say in the last moments uh, that I have with you is just what we're doing now. So quantum chemistry has become a huge focus of attention. Many, uh, many people are working on it. It's been kind of gratifying now. It's in the hands of people who are uh, much more qualified to think in detail about chemistry than I am. And so uh, we've been interested in the last few years about, an, about the question of can we move from thinking about chemical systems to thinking about fundamental physical systems described in terms of quantum field theory. Um, one's immediate reaction is no, because in what I've told you, the idea of having a fixed particle number is rather important. Um, and the first thing one learns uh, 
probably in the first lecture of any quantum field theory course, is there's no sensible relativistic theory uh, of quantum mechanics with a fixed particle number. Because if you have energy uncertainty on the one hand, and you have E equals MT squared, uh, so the potential for particle pair creation on the other hand, you put those two things together, the, the theory can boil away with a virtual creation of pairs of particles. And so there's no, there's no fixed particle number theory. Uh, another discouraging fact, I think, about approaches to uh, quantum field theory is many of them use lattice methods or use a grid. Um, to, to put those on a quantum computer requires putting the lattice into the qubits. It's very easy to get thousands or hundreds of thousands of qubit requirements for those things. Um, much of what I've talked about today has been calculation of static properties, energy eigenvalues. Uh, field theory calculations are often focused on things like scattering cross sections, which require dynamics. So is there any way out of all this doom and gloom? And so fortunately, uh, Ken Wilson thought about this question in 1990. Uh, it's an interesting historical fact that Wilson's father was E. Bright Wilson, who was a, a, a quantum chemist himself. Um, and so he wrote this very nice paper comparing chemistry approaches to, uh, to lattice gauge theory approaches, which of course he was a major uh, developer of. Um, and he proposed in that paper that the light front or infinite momentum frame formulation of field theory might be in a, a, an appealing way to use ideas from chemistry uh, to simulate field theory. And so here are just a laundry list of attractive things about the light front, which really one can think of as taking the perspective of a massless observer instead of a massive observer. Um, and many things change about field theory when you do this. One obtains a trivial vacuum, the orbital basis, an orbital basis formulation is rather easy. And so this is something we've been working on in collaboration with, uh, with James um, for the last couple of years. And we think it's very promising. So I'm not gonna uh, describe this in detail. It's a whole other talk really to talk about um, these field theory approaches, but we're very excited about it. And here's the, the, the little group, um, my colleagues at Tufts back in the days when we could be physically in the same location and uh, James and Xiaoyang. Um, and here are some references. So this is where, really where we're interested in, in going next, is sort of adapting these ideas from chemistry uh, and taking them off into the realm of, um, into the realm of fundamental physics. With that, uh, it only remains for me to thank uh, the folks who have funded this work, which is the NSF and the Department of Energy, and to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for wonderful, um overview of a, of a whole variety of fundamental issues on quantum computing. Um, we have um, many people in the seminar, um, I think, uh, but not so many that you can't just uh, unmute and ask your question. So um, let's go ahead and open up the floor for questions for, for Peter Love. Everyone's too shy. Somebody's. Uh, yeah, can I just ask quickly? Uh, in when you do quantum chemistry problems uh, using these algorithms, how do they scale with the number of atoms or with the number of basis sets compared to the way you would do them on you know traditional classical computers? Yeah. So the the, um, the number of qubits scales with the. For the local methods, the number of qubits scales with the number of orbitals in your basis. So it's rather easy to write down problems with hundreds of uh, orbitals that would require hundreds of logical qubits that are really quite uh, challenging for classical chemistry. Um, for example, if you look at the exascale quantum chemistry work that's being done by Robert ha Harrison at um, Stony Brook, the, the problems that they're pushing towards are really sort of Hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of orbitals uh, type problems, and then the gate scaling for time evolution. The detailed studies that have been done by Google. Um, well, okay, so the the key variable there is the number of terms in the Hamiltonian, which obviously is the fourth power in general of the um, 
of the number of orbitals. Uh, and so the, really it's sort of n to the fourth log n uh, for time evolution. Um, but there's been a lot of work at Google recently that have, have used different bases and um, have really done a lot of work bringing that scaling down to, to n squared now, I think they've got it. Um, and so they've put out um, studies of particular calculations that require only sort of a million what are called T gates, which are the really challenging gates in their architecture. And so, uh, so the, 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 the answer is that all of those things are, are at this point, I think, well understood. Uh, certainly the gate scaling is challenging for, um, the gate scaling is challenging for, for phase estimation, but it's, it's, it's sort of brim, been brought within the range that people are really seriously studying, you know, how to do it on an, on an actual physical hardware, which is very exciting. And then if you talk about VQE, uh, then the number of measurements you have to perform, which is what really hurts you there, is um, goes like the number of terms in the Hamiltonian divided by the square of the epsilon, the precision you want to achieve. Of course, for, for really ab initio quantum chemistry, epsilon is pretty small. Uh, so the precision target is very difficult. So there's been a lot of work uh, on transformations that, that reduce the number of measurements you need to make. And um, I think with there, we're not quite, no one's really confident that you can do a VQE experiment that would be competitive with a classical calculation with the techniques we know right now. But everyone, you know, it's, at this stage, it's just trying to get to the next experiment. So what's the next largest thing we can do? Uh, Peter, thank you. Can you see the uh, questions that are appearing oh, in the chat window? I have a full screen here, and um, maybe I can stop sharing my screen. Yeah, and then if you take a look at the chat um, window, you have a one from Yangshan Yao first. Oh, can I specify a bit more about post trotter? Yes. So the problem with trotterization is uh, now, now, if we think not about the energy, the error in the final energy, but if you think about the error the error which arises between your discretized time evolution and the, and the true time evolution operator. So let's call that epsilon. Um, trotterization uh, has a cost by a number of gates that scales with some power of one over epsilon. So if you want twice that precision, you have to double the length of the circuit or worse. Um, so what I call post-trotter methods are things that go by the name of cubitization, um, so these are methods for simulating Hamiltonians with an, a cost that scales like the logarithm of one over epsilon. Um, they're rather hard to describe. Um, I think they're uh, some of the most interesting quantum algorithms. Uh, what, to just give you a flavor of how they work, uh, one of the things that you can see happening in trotterization is you chop up the Hamiltonian and then the actions you're doing are these individual evolution under individual terms of the Hamiltonian. So one of the common features of these post-trotter post, sort of post algorithms uh, is you give the quantum computer coherent access to the terms in the Hamiltonian. So typically they require you to construct an ANSAT state, which is uh, which contains inside it the coefficients in the Hamiltonian, and then the, the, then using that information, one can construct quantum algorithms that, that have this log one over epsilon scale. Great. So next uh, question is from Sohan Paul. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, would, st would stabilizer codes be useful in this regard? Well, the, the, uh, the approach that we, we pursued in my group, uh, which we got scooped on uh, by Arthur Ismailov uh, at Toronto, um, shows it's a very good idea, um, is, called, is what, what Arta called um, unitary partitioning. And so there, what you do is you try to, you know, in VQE, you have a, an ANSATS preparation <laughs> circuit that's preparing the state that you're estimating and optimizing. And then you, you measure these poorly operators. One of the things you can do is append a few extra operations to your ANSATS preparation that rotates the poorly operations into each other. And one of the 
ways that you can do that is by grouping your Pauli terms into uh, linear combinations that square to the identity. Um, and so with such a, you can rotate any such combination into a single Pauli operator. Um, and we, we have uh, some unpublished work where we're actually implementing this and it does, that works very nicely. It reduces the number of measurements. Um, although that doesn't make use of stabilizer code ideas directly, um, you can certainly think of the Pauli operators that occur in, in those groups as being kind of encodings of single qubits in a way that's quite analogous to, to stabilizer codes. Another question from Weiji Du. Do you need to worry about the anti-commutation uh, fermions and bosons? So I didn't talk about bosons in this talk at all, really. Uh, so everything I said about Jordan Wigner and BK was um, was specific to fermions, and everything about those mappings is constructed to get the uh, fermion anti-commutation relations correct. Um, if you're simulating bosons, you have another problem, which is, as you know, there's no finite dimensional. Uh, faithful representation of the boson commutation relations because um, which you can just prove by taking the trace. Um, so you have to introduce a cutoff for bosons and then approximate the commutation relations only below the cutoff in occupation number. Um, and then you you always have an error term that hangs around at the, at the cutoff. Um, but apart from that, because uh, because uh, local operators with distinct locality commute anyway, it's it's somewhat easier to do bosons. You don't have to worry about keeping track of all this parity information. Let me uh, throw in a question. Um, so thinking like a physicist, let's say, I, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm enamored by the techniques, but I have my own favorite Hamiltonian. Right, I'm starting, my starting point is, I know the Hamiltonian, I'm looking around for the method to solve, uh, let's say the eigensolver problem or uh, a time evolution problem with that Hamiltonian. Now, based on what you said today, there's a host of what you call post-trotter uh, techniques. Um, is there a prescriptive, say, rule book that says, if your Hamiltonian looks like this, then you want this post-trotter. If it looks like that, you want that post-trotter. We're, we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the absolutely serious answer. Um, is that now that we, you know, now that we have optimal algorithms for at least a large scale, for large scale error corrected quantum computers, the, the goal now is just, okay, um, let's, let's implement these uh, let's implement these optimal algorithms and then and then you know figure out how to use the structure that's present in, in a particular Hamiltonian to reduce the cost even further. And so we're actually working on that pretty hard right now. Um, or I should say my graduate students are working on it. Um, and and it's very nice to be at the stage where, you know, because one knows that these algorithms are optimal, you can just sit down and say, okay, let's go. And, and uh, so, the, so the dream is that you, you can write, you know, you can write down your favorite Hamiltonian on a piece of paper and then plug it in and we'll just tell you, oh, the, 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 here are the costs for simulating whatever you want from this. Great, great. I think there's lots of room for further discussion on that. Let's go to the next question in the chat box. So um, uh, Shin Yao has another question. Uh, so I see. The VQ application of quantum chemistry, as far as ANSATS is concerned, the UCCSD or hardware efficient do not seem to be scalable to large sizes. The accuracy is not guaranteed. Yeah, this is a this is a big thing to worry about. Certainly, hardware efficient algorithms, um, I think, have so just to say what that is. Um, in any particular piece of hardware, there'll be some natural variables that that describe the states that are constructed by that hardware. And so uh, a hardware efficient ANSATS is just an ANSATS that uses those as the, as the optimization variables and doesn't, um, doesn't necessarily pay any attention to the structure of the problem. Uh, so IBM, that nature paper of IBM was of this kind. Um, Gerald McLean at Google wrote a very nice paper where he showed that 
if you you know if you don't pay attention to the structure that's present in the problem you run into what's called the barren plateau problem which where essentially eventually all the derivatives with respect to your parameters in your optimization will go to zero at which point you're sort of lost because you don't know which direction to go to optimize the answer um, so i think hardware efficient is certainly uh not going to scale up um uc csd um i mean i think scalable whether they're scalable to large size and whether you have a guarantee of the accuracy are sort of two separate questions um this i mean i think certainly the spirit of these variation algorithms is very much kind of you have to try it and see so um so i think you know, UCCSD is very challenging to implement. Um, so probably we're going to run into problems there. At the moment, I, my feeling is that that we we have to keep working on the measurements a bit more uh, before we come down to the ANSATs. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I don't think, I think the spirit of your question is correct in that I don't think we know right now if someone gave us a 100 qubit quantum computer we don't know what the ANSATs we would use to, to make use of such a large device is. Um, so I think that's definitely something that, that where there needs to be more work. Well, let, let me pop in another question. I, I don't see anybody waiting, uh, say with another chat question, but um, so last week on uh, Thursday, there was a seminar presented by a fellow, Lin Lin on quantum computing on the, uh, over internet. And um, he showed a, a set of techniques where you start with a uh, Hermitian, but um, a small matrix and you, you actually make it into a unitary matrix, but it's a larger matrix problem. Is that something you've explored uh, with your quantum chemistry uh, problems or did you not find that necessary or what was um, the connection there? So, so there's, a, there's a kind of strand of work now um, that, that I have not been involved in. Um, that, so I, let, me, let me make a suggestion, which is uh, the Google Symposium talks from this year are, um, are now on YouTube somewhere. You have to Google them, presumably. Um, one of those talks is uh, by some, well, two of those talks are about systematic ways of uh, classifying and then hopefully discovering uh, quantum algorithms. Um, and one of those talks is by some work is about some work by Nathan Weed and collaborators um, that, that uses this embedding technique uh, sort of fairly centrally. Um, but no, I mean in the in the work that I described here, we didn't we didn't really make use of that. Uh, ex, you know, except that in in these post trotter algorithms. You, you want to uh, you want to have decompositions of the Hamiltonian where the terms in the decomposition themselves are unitary, where obviously some embedding technique that could accomplish that would be very useful. Um, but that, but that, yeah, the, the other talk there is by uh, Shelby Kimmel from Middlebury, um, and so uh, you know it's kind of exciting to see. Uh, it's, it's exciting to see there starting to be sort of systematic ways of thinking about quantum algorithms and quantum speed up. Um, the, the, the work here, I would say, definitely came out of the idea that, you know, in 2005, we didn't have anything like that. So uh, we knew quantum simulation was a promising application, so we just sort of dived into it. Um, but now, you know, if you ask the question, uh, can I have a quantum speed up for this particular problem, there's at least a couple of frameworks um, where you can really think about that. And that's that's very exciting to see. Yeah, I think that ties in nicely with some of the things that our local Iowa State uh, team is very interested in, and that is um, making models for how you approach, uh, say, uh, applications on uh, quantum computers and uh, uh, this has been a discussion locally and also figured into our uh, pre-proposal to the NSF. So um, maybe yeah. there's a separate discussion we should have more on that later and 
go back to those references that you just uh, gave to us. Thank you. Everyone's into the coffee break now. We've all should have had some sips of coffee. And uh, are there any other uh, questions? Uh, if not, um, we have recorded the, the uh, meeting today. And um, with your permission, uh, Peter will make that available. Oh. And um, if you would also kindly uh, share your slides with, oh. uh, with me or with Bo, uh, that would be great. We can make a put that a bit, make that available. Uh, if, if others are like me, I, a first pass is wonderful. It gets me all excited, but I don't get the depth of understanding that I often like to get from a talk like yours. So I'd like to be able to go back and uh, review some of the finer points and perhaps get back to you with additional questions. Okay, well, uh, I want to thank you, Peter, especially for uh, presenting your wonderful seminar for us today. And thank you all to our uh, attendees and for the questions you've asked. I uh, look forward to seeing you all again in, uh, at our next seminar, uh, which Wei Ji Du will present in the uh, third week in uh, November. And you stay tuned, watch out, watch for the announcement on the details. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank stay you. Stay safe, stay safe, have a great weekend, take care. <laughs>